Elizabeth and thank you for coming to our channel explore the unknown if you like our videos please hit the like subscribe and the bell because we upload weekly today I'm going to be going over a case that the victim actually solved her own murder it is Michelle Martinko she was a beautiful young woman at the age of 18 years old just starting out her life when she was 12, Michelle was diagnosed with scoliosis. That's a curvature of the spine. She had to wear a brace that went from her neck all the way down to her hips for many years. Now, Michelle had an older sister, and her name was Janelle. She was born 12 years before Michelle was born. Now, Michelle's mother had several miscarriages before she had become pregnant with Michelle. Now when Janelle was getting married, Michelle was her flower girl at her wedding. Now Michelle felt different and self-conscious. She could not move like the other kids her age. And it was a tough time for her. But at age 14, she was able to put the brace away. And then everything changed for Michelle. At the time, Farrah Fawcett's hairdo was very well known and everybody wanted her style, including Michelle. She had beautiful long blonde hair and she was being noticed by all sorts of guys. Then she met Andy Sedell. He was a year older than Michelle. She had met him when she was roller skating and he was known as a flashy sports guy to many. They had dated for about a couple years, then had broken up. She really did not want to be committed into a relationship. She was just very active and wanted to explore. She was outgoing and just loved life. However, Andy did not take it that well of their breakup at all. After the breakup, he would not let her go. He wanted to know her every move, who she was seeing, where she was going, who her friends are. Now this time of year, there is a lot of joy and giving, happiness of celebration of Christmas that was right around the corner. It was on December 20th, 1979, when she went to Wesdale Mall to get gift for her mom. She wanted to get her a coat. Now she had $186, but had changed her mind about it. Then she had bumped into a classmate she knew, which was Tracy Price, that he had warned her about flashing her money around. He did not want her to get robbed. Michelle had never went to this mall, and she was really anxious about being alone in the mall. So she had left to go home. She did park pretty far away from the mall. From there, it looked like she had gotten into her car and her life ended right there in the parking lot of the mall. She had went to just hours earlier. She had been stabbed multiple times. She had fought really hard for her life. She had self-defense wounds on her arms, hands, and body. It looked like she wanted to make sure that her death was not going to be unsolved. And in doing so, the killer had cut himself in the process. The investigator was Detective Harvey Dillinger. He was on the case trying to piece at what happened to Michelle the night just before Christmas she was never going to see. Now why he killed her was unknown. When she was found, she still had the money with her. 
She did have a bag with some items that she had purchased in the back seat. Those weren't taken at all. So they knew it was not robbery. And then when the autopsy came back, there was no sexual assault. Michelle did have cuts on her hands and her body. So the motive was going to be hard to prove if and when they do catch the murderer. Now, the killer did come prepared. He did bring rubber gloves. There was imprints of that on the outside of the car. They also found them inside the car with blood all over. They could not find no fingerprints. They had no witnesses and the very few leads to go on, but they did have blood at the scene. But the killer's identity was unknown. Detective Harvey had interviewed everyone that had known Michelle, including her ex-boyfriend, Andy. The detectives had learned in the investigation that Michelle had saw him in the mall the night that she died. When questioned, he did have an alibi that his mom had provided and that she said he was home all night long. Detective Harvey had cleared every male that she had known and they all had been cleared. Mike Ryrick, he had been questioned and he was an ex-boyfriend, but he was a hundred miles away at college and he had dated her. He was intimidated by the police. He said it was very scary to him how they were tough and forceful. Mike was never really considered a suspect though. Michelle's murder had rocked the small city of 110,000 in Cedar Rapids. At Michelle's funeral, everyone was suspicious about Andy and how he took Michelle's death. He was very emotional and at one point he had even wrapped his arms around Michelle in the casket and kept saying to everyone who she really loved. Did she love him or Mike? And who she loved just before she died. The police still had no evidence that he had done anything to Michelle. He had left the small town after high school and then he joined the Navy. But him leaving did not take away the suspicion on him, being a suspect to those who lived in the town, including Michelle's family. Her mom and dad took it really hard when she died. Now her mom had kept a journal of all the suspects and Andy's name was at the top and it was circled. After Michelle died, her mom would get a prank phone calls from people and it would take a toll on her for years. She wondered why she died and who could have killed their daughter. It was only a matter of time, but however, the years went by and the case had gotten cold. Michelle's parents died thinking that Andy had killed their daughter. Then in 2005, Detective Doug Larson came in charge. You see, he had went to high school with Michelle. They were really never close, but her death did affect him. He felt compelled to get her murder and to bring her justice. In years, technology had changed and was emerging with forensic tools to solve cold cases. So he started to want to solve Michelle's case with those new tools that were provided at the time. So he sent the blood samples that they had from Michelle's car and from her bloody dress she wore on the night that she died. He had sent it to the lab for testing, but nobody had gotten back from the lab. They had gotten lost in the file. Then when Detective Doug found the lab report, it had showed up that it was a male DNA. There was a spot on her dress that was from a male DNA and from the gear shift selector in the car also was the male DNA. It was the same DNA match. So the blood on her dress and the blood on the gear shift was the same person and he was a male. They knew it was one person who killed Michelle. Then more decades would come. With Michelle's mom, dad, and sister, also Michelle's friend, Tracy, Mike, her ex-boyfriend, and her close friend, Gail Dawson, her murder left a deep mark and a scar, and it was always in their hearts. 
every December there was an anniversary of her death. The ones close to Michelle that knew her were victims too. Innocence of Michelle was taken from this earth. Gail, her best friend, was always scared growing up. She was afraid all the time going into places that the ones before the murder of her best friend Michelle, she would have gone out with no hesitation to these places. It had seemed to everyone that the killer just vanished. But in the year 2005, there was the new DNA on the dress and the gear shift now, and it was just a matter of time. The old evidence had a new light on it. Detective Doug Larson had shipped the samples of the blood that they had found, and they put it into CODIS, the nationwide database hoping that they would find some kind of suspect, but they never had. It was never found a hit at all. Another dead end. So the detectives went back to Cedar Rapids and they began to collect data samples from everyone that was interviewed and that knew Michelle. It was a process and time consuming to collect all the data to eliminate. Everyone was eliminated one by one and no one that they had interviewed years ago came up with a hit or a match. Even Andy, who was thought to be the killer, he was eliminated too. Andy was a victim himself because many, many people were pointing their fingers at Andy. It was haunting and frustrating 10 years for Detective Doug. He had went to his superiors and asked to get someone else on the case. He was really burnt out and trying to find who had done this to her. He knew he needed some fresh eyes on the case and that this was when Detective Matt Dinglinger came on the scene to take over. You see, that's Detective Harvey Dinglinger's son, who was little at the time. He was a small child when Michelle was murdered and he became a detective just like his dad and his name is Matthew. Then Detective Matt, just like his dad, who is retired now, started looking into the case. He had new eyes on Michelle's case to figure out who could have killed her. Detective Matt also went to his father to get help on the case. In 2015, he took over as lead detective on Michelle's case. DNA had once again changed and had gotten even more advanced, even further. So they thought they got more information on the DNA profile. So they found out that the killer's eyes, color, hair, and race. They had sent what they had to Virginia Parabon Nanolabs. So they would come up with a deposit of what the murder would look like. They had put a face to the killer. He was a white male, blonde hair, and blue eyes. However, they did not know his age or have any clue on how he wore his hair at that time. So they made different hairdos for different looks. They were hoping that someone would remember seeing him. Now this town, everyone was trying to figure out who he could be. The police got over a hundred tips, but none had panned out. Then, in 2018, it was all over the news when the Golden State Killer was caught, brought in for serial murders and rapes of decades-long spree with him not getting caught. It was also known worldwide how they did catch him through genetic genealogy. So they went through the genetic genealogy they had charted one family member to another family member. Then a Parabon was ready to test the DNA. The national database called GEDmatch are there their own voluntarily. They do a trace of their own family trees. In July 2018, the police got back the report said they found a relative to your killer of Michelle. Her name was Brandy Jennings from Vancouver, Washington. She is a second cousin once removed from the killer. Brandy Jennings was 
an office manager and a single mom. So they started with her to work their way to the killer. It had been narrowed down to three brothers in Iowa on October 2018. Detective Matt did a painstaking stalking to narrow down the three brothers and which one he was. So they had Kenneth, Jerry, and Donald Burns. So they set up a team to collect DNA without them knowing it. They had followed one brother to lunch and grabbed his discarded straw. Then the second brother, his toothpaste from his garbage. And then the third, Jerry. They had spotted him at a pizza restaurant. He had two sodas with one straw. They had taken the samples and were sent back to the lab to see which brother was the murderer. Donald and Kenneth were cleared and was not a match at all. However, the result came back to match Jerry. So it was clear that he was the killer of Michelle. But why? Why would he kill her for no reason? It did not make sense at all to the detectives. There was no connection to Michelle at all, nor the car. When they started digging into Jerry's background, they found a resume that was not of a cold-blooded killer at all. No criminal record. He was a respected businessman. He had wife and three kids. Now, Detective Matt had picked a day, a very special day, to interview Jerry at his business. It was on December 19th, 2018, exactly 39 years to the day after Michelle was murdered. He wanted to talk to him on that day to get him nervous, maybe to confess. And also, he would bring up what day it was to Jerry. Detective Matt used a hidden camera in a cup to record everything. He wanted to get a confession on tape. So he asked him about the mall and if he had ever been there with his family at any point. They had arrested Jerry for the murder of Michelle, despite him not revealing that he was the killer. Lots of things about this suspect did not make sense at all. For the family of Michelle, her sister Janelle, she said she was so glad that she was still alive to see justice for her baby sister. She really thought that this day would never come and that she would die just like her mom and dad before seeing someone brought in for her murder. Now, as for the family of Jerry Burns, his daughter Jennifer and his brother Donald said they could not see him doing such a crime. This came such a shock to them that this could not be their dad, said Jennifer. In February of 2020, Michelle's killer went on trial for more than f over 40 years after her brutal murder. The prosecutor said there is 100 billion chance that this could be somebody else. And there's 8 billion people. That's worldwide. The verdict came back guilty just after three hours. It was guilty of murder in first degree. Even though they caught the killer for Michelle, in Cedar Rapids, there's a still lingering question now on others that he might have killed, like Jody Hodenstrat. She was a blonde hair anchor woman, kidnapped near her car as well, just like Michelle, in a parking lot in 1995. She was never found. She worked in Mason City, Iowa, just two hours from where Jerry lived, but there was no evidence that he even knew her. Maybe he had saw her on TV news. She does have a striking resemblance to Michelle. They could be sisters. As for Michelle, she fought so hard for her life that it caused Jerry to cut himself in the process of murdering her. And Michelle helped to solve her own murder even many decades later. Every year after Michelle's death, her friends and family and generations of investigators gather around to celebrate her memory. They say that this case isn't just about her death, it's about her life. Her name will forever be etched in local history as part of Cedar Rapids' most haunting crime. So what do you think, guys? Is Jerry 
the real murderer of Michelle? And what about Jody, the anchor woman? Could he have killed her also? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much for being here. Until the next video, you guys take care and God bless. Bye.